heavy, unkind brow, and dart not scornful glances from those eyes to wound thy lord, thy king, thy governor. It blots thy beauty, its frosts do bite the meads. Confounds thy fame as whirlwinds shake fair buds, and in no sense is meet or amiable. A woman moved is like a fountain troubled, muddy, <laughs> ill-seeming, thick, bereft of beauty. And, and while it is so, none so dry or thirsty will deign to sip or touch one drop of it. Thy husband is thy lord, <laughs> thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy, thy sovereign, sovereign, one that cares for thee, and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labor, both by sea and land, to watch the night in storms, the day in cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and craves no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience, too little payment for so great a debt, such duty as the subject owes the prince. Even such a woman oweth to her husband. And when she is froward, peevish, sullen, sour, and not obedient to his honest will, what is she but a foul contending rebel and graceless traitor to her loving lord? I am ashamed that women are so simple to offer war where they should kneel for peace, or seek for rule, supremacy, and sway when they are bound to serve, love, and obey. Why are our bodies soft and weak and smooth, unapt to toil and trouble in the world, but that our soft conditions and our hearts should well agree with our external parts? Come, come, you forward and unable words! My mind hath been as big as one of yours, my heart as great, my reason happily more, to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws, our strengths as weak, our weakness past compare, that seeming to be most, which we indeed least are. Then veil your stomachs, for it is no boot, and place your hand below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please. My, My hand is ready, may it do him ease. recognize Kate's final monologue from William Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew. A shrew, by definition, is a woman of violent speech and temper, often an obstinate wife. If you were listening closely, you might have heard some troubling lines. They bother us too. This problematic speech, which supposedly represents what Kate has learned throughout the course of the play, was the inspiration for this theatrical production. As we explored Shakespeare's text, we looked for creative ways to justify it for 21st century social attitudes rather than those of the 1590s. In the next 60 minutes, we will explore six different approaches to the play, emphasizing the relationship between Petruchio and Catherine. The actors will be switching roles throughout the production, and you will recognize the characters through the following costume pieces and accessories. Kate. <laughs> Petruchio. Baptista. Bianca. Grimio. Hortensio. Lucentio. Grumio. Tranio. Elizabethan aesthetic. Although we cannot entirely recreate the setting or audience as they would have responded to the words of Shakespeare, it serves as the starting point to our exploration. Actors from the Renaissance stage would have based their characters on physical archetypes instead of their psychological motivations. <laughs> Gentlemen! Importune me no further, for how I firmly am resolved, you know, that is, not to bestow my youngest daughter before I have a husband for the elder. If either of you both love Catherine, <laughs> because I know you well and love you well, leave shall you have to court her at your pleasure. To cart her, rather. She's too rough for me. There, there, Hortensio, will you any wife? 
I pray you, sir, is it your will to make a stale of me amongst these mates? Mates, maid? How mean you that? No mates for you, unless you were of gentler, milder mold. <laughs> if faith, sir, then you shall never need to fear. Indeed, it is not halfway to her heart. But if it were, doubt not her care should be to comb your noddle with a three-legged stool and paint your face and use you like a fool. silence do I see maids mild behavior and sobriety. Peace, Trenio. Though the nature of our quarrel yet never brook debate, know now upon advice, it toucheth us both, that we may yet again have access to our fair mistress, and be happy rivals in Bianca's love to labor and effect, one thing especially. What's that, I pray? Marry, sir, to get a husband for her sister. A husband? A devil. I say a husband. I say a devil. Thinkest thou, Hortensio, though her father be very rich? Any man is so very a fool to be married to hell. Tush, Fremio. Though it pass your patience and mind to endure her loud alarms, why, men, there be good fellows in the world. If a man put light on them, would take her with all faults and money enough. <laughs> Gale blows you to Padua here from old Verona. Such winds as scatter young men through the world to seek their fortunes farther than at home, where small experience grows. But in a few, Signor Hortensio, thus it stands with me. My father Antonio is deceased. And I have thrust myself into this maze happily to wive and thrive as best I may. Crowns in my purse I have, and goods at home, and so I'm come abroad to see the world. Petruchio, shall I then come roundly to thee and wish thee to shrewd, ill-favored wife? Thou thank me but a little for my counsel, and yet I'll promise thee she shall be rich, and very rich. But thou art too much my friend, and I'll not wish thee to her. Signor Hortensio, twixt such friends as we, few words suffice. And therefore, if thou know one rich enough to be Petruchio's wife, as wealth is burden of my wooing dance. She moves me not, or not removes, at least, affection's edge in me, were she as rough as are the swelling Adriatic seas. I come to wive it wealthily in Padua. If wealthily, then happily in Padua. I can, Petruchio, help thee to a wife with wealth enough, and young, and beauteous, brought up as best becomes a gentlewoman. Her only fault, and that is false enough, <laughs> Is that she is intolerable, cursed, and true, and growered, <laughs> so beyond all measure that were my state far worse than it is, I would not wed her for a mine of gold. Peace, Hortensio, thou knowest not gold's effect. Give me her father's name, and tis enough, for I will board her, though she chide as loud as thunder when the clouds in autumn crack. Her father is Baptista Minola, an affable and courteous gentleman. Her name is Caterina Minola. Renowned in Padua for her scolding tongue. I know her father, though I know not her. And he knew my deceased father well. I will not sleep, Hortensio, till I see her. Oh, oh sir, such a life to such a wife were it strange, but if you the stomach for it, to it in God's name. I will be assisting you in all. But will you woo this wild hat? Will I live? Will he woo her? I, or I'll hang her. Why came I hither <laughs> but to that intent? Think you a little din can daunt mine ears? Have I not in my time heard lions roar? Have I not heard the sea puffed up with winds rage like an angry boar, chafed with sweat? Have I not heard great ordnance in the field and heaven's artillery thunder in the skies? Have I not in a pitched battle heard loud lorums, neighing steeds, and trumpets clang. And do you tell me of a woman's tongue, which gives not half so great a blow to hear as will a chestnut in a farmer's fire? Tush, tush, fear, boys, with bugs. For he fears none. <laughs> Petruchio 
Lucio tames Kate with love. Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard but something hard of hearing? They call me Catherine, that you talk of me. You lie in faith, for you are called plain Kate, and Bonnie Kate, and sometimes Kate the Curse, but Kate, <laughs> the prettiest Kate in Christendom, Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates, and therefore Kate, Take this of me, Kate of my consolation, hearing thy mildness praise in every town, thy virtue spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs. Myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. <laughs> moved? In good time let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first, you were movable. Why, what's a movable? A joined stool. Thou hast hit it, come. Sit on me. <laughs> Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such jade as you, if me you mean. <laughs> Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee, for knowing thee to be but young and light. Too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be. Should be, should buzz. Come, come, you waspy faith, you are too angry. <laughs> I'm waspish, best beware my stain. My remedy is then to pluck it out. Aye, if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? And his tail. And his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you speak of tails and so farewell. What, with my tongue in your tail? <laughs> Nay, come again, good Kate. I am a gentleman. What is your crest? A cock's comb? A combless cock, so Kate will be my hen. Mm, no cock of mine. You crow to you like a craven. Nay. Hear you, Kate. Come, you must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here is no crab, and therefore look not sour. Mm, there is, there is. Then show it me. Had I glass, I would. What? You mean my face? <clears throat> well, aimed for such a young one. Now, by St. George, I am too young for you. Yet you are withered. Tis with cares. I care not. Nay, here you cape in sooth. You scape not, sir. I chave you if I tarry, let me no. go. Not a whit. I find you passing gentle. Twas told me you were rough and coy and sullen, and now I find report a very liar. For thou art pleasant, gamesome, passing courteous, but slow in speech. Such sweet as springtime flowers. Thou canst not frown, thou canst not look askance, nor bite the lip as angry wenches will, nor hast thou pleasure to be cross in talk, but thou with mildness entertainst thy wooers with gentle confidence, soft and affable. Where, where did you study all this goodly speech? It is extempore from my mother wit. A witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Enough to keep you warm. Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed. And therefore, setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms, your father hath consented that you shall be my wife. Your dowry greed on, and will you nil you, I will marry you. Now, Kate, I am a husband for your turn, for by this slight, whereby I see thy beauty. Thy beauty that doth make me like thee well. Thou must be married to no man but me. For I am he and born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable as other household Kates. Here comes your father. Never make denial. I must and will have Catherine to my wife. And Petruchio does have Catherine for his wife. He wastes no time marrying her the very next day, and whisks her off to his home in Verona. Once there, he sets about taming her, showing her that only through gentle love will she be happy. The more am I wrong, the more his spite appears. What, did he marry me to, to famish me? 
Beggars that come unto my father's house upon entreaty have present alms. But I, who never knew how to entreat, nor never needed that I should entreat, am starved for meat, kidding for lack of sleep, with oaths kept waking and with brawling fed. That which spites me more than all these wants, he does it under the name of perfect love. As if who should say, if I should sleep or eat, for a deadly sickness or else present death? How fares my cake? What is sweeping all the more? Ain't as cold as can <laughs> be. Pluck up thy spirits, look cheerfully upon me. Here, love, thou seest how diligent I am to dress thy neath myself and bring it thee. I am sure, sweet Kate, this kindness merits thanks. What? Not a word? Nay, then thou likest it not, and all my pains is sorted to no proof. Here, uh, take away this dish. I pray you, let it stand. The poorest service is repaid with thanks, and so shall mine before you touch the meat. I thank you, sir. Much good do it unto thy gentle heart. Kate, eat a face. And now, my honey love, will we unto your father's house to revel it as bravely as the best, with silken coats and caps and golden rings, with ruffs and cuffs and farthingales and things, with scarfs and fans, and double change of bravery, with amber bracelets, beads, and all this knavery. What, hast thou dined? The tailor stays thy leisure to deck thy body with his ruffling treasure. <laughs> Come, Taylor, let us see these ornaments. Lay forth the cap for music, sir. Here is the cap your worship did bespeak. Why, this was molded on a porringer, a velvet dish. Fie, fie, tis lewd and filthy. Why, tis a cockle, or a, a walnut shell, a knack, a toy, a trick, a baby's cap. Away with it, come let me have a bigger. I'll have no bigger. This doth fit the time, and gentlemen wear caps such as these. And when you are gentle, you shall have one too. But not till then. <laughs> <laughs> Why, sir, I trust I may have leave to speak. And speak I shall. I am no child, no babe. Your betters have endured me, say my mind, and if you cannot, best you stop your ears. My tongue will tell the angers of my heart, or else my heart concealing it shall break. And rather than it shall, I will be free, even at the uttermost, as I please, in words. What thou sayest true. Tis a paltry cap, a custard coffin, a bauble, a silky pie. I love thee well, in that thou likest it not. Love me or love me not. I like the cap, and it I will have, or I will have none. Well, come, my Kate. We will unto your fathers, even in these honest, mean habiliments. Our purses shall be proud, and our garments poor, for tis the mind that makes the body rich. What? Is the jay more precious than the lark, because his feathers are more beautiful? Oh, no, good Kate. Neither art thou the worse for this poor furniture and mean array. If thou accountst it shame, lay it on me. And therefore frolic, we will henceforth with the feast and sports at thy father's house. Let's see, I think it is some seven o'clock, and well we shall come there by dinner time. I dare assure you tis almost two, and twill be supper time ere we go there. It shall be seven ere I go to horse. Look, what I say, or do, or think to do, you are still crossing it. I will not go today. And ere I do, it shall be what o'clock I say it is. By the time Kate and Petruchia return to Padua for her sister's wedding, Kate has had a change of heart. Come. Come, you froward and unable worms. My mind hath been as big as one of yours. My heart is great, my reason haply more. To bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws, our strength as weak, 
our weakness past compare, that seeming to be most which we indeed least are. Then fill your stomachs, for it is no boot, and place your hand below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if you please, my hand is ready, may it do him ease. Why, there is a wench. Come on and kiss me, kid. don't want to accept about the taming of the shrew. In this next approach, Petruchio is a misogynist. It is his world, and soon enough, Kate will be forced to live in it. Possession, 20,000 crowns. And for that dowry, I'll assure of her widowhood, be it that she survived me in all my lands at least whatsoever. <laughs> Let specialties be therefore drawn between us, that covenants may be kept on either hand. Aye, when the special thing is well obtained, that is her love, for that is all and all. Why, that, <laughs> that is nothing for mother. I tell you, I am as preemptory as she is proud minded. And where two raging fires meet together, they do consume the thing that feeds their fury. Though little fire grows great with little wind, yet extreme gusts fall at fire and all. So I've heard, and so 
she yields to me. <laughs> For I am rough and wound not like a babe. Well mayest thou woo, and happy be thy speed, but be thou armed for some unhappy word. Uh, I to the proof, as mountains are for winds that shake not, though they do blow perpetually. Uh, Signor Petruchio, will you go with us, or shall I send my daughter Kate to you? I pray you do. Good morrow, Kate. But that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard? It's something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine that you talk of me. Aw, oh, you lying babe. For you are called plain Kate. And Bonnie Kate and sometimes Kate first, but Kate. The prettiest Kate in Christendom. Kate of Kate Hall. My super dainty Kate. For dainties are all Kate's. And, and therefore, Kate, take this of me, Kate of my consolation. Hearing that mountain is priest in every town, Thy virtue spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to be belonged. Myself am moved to woo thee for my wife. Moved? In good time, let him that moves you hither remove you hence. I knew at the first you were immovable. Why, what's immovable? A joined stool. <laughs> oh, now it's tinted. Come, sit on me. Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such shade as you of me, you mean. Oh, ask it, Kate. I will not ruin thee. For knowing me to be but young and light. Too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be. Come, come, you wasp, in faith, you are too angry. If I be waspish, best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. Aye, if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp is where a sting? In his tail. In his tongue. Whose tongue? In yours, you talk of tails, and so farewell. What? With my tongue and your tail? Ha ha ha! Nay, come again, good case. I am a gentleman. That I'll try. I swear I'll come to you through strife again. I care not. Nay, Kate. My suit is Kate, not so. I chafe you if I tarry, let me go. No! Not a whit. I find you passing gentle. Twas told me you were rough and coy and sore. And now I find her for to bury lies. For there are pleasant, <laughs> game some. Passing courteous, but slow in speech yet. Sweet as springtime flowers. Thou canst not frown, thou canst not quick as dance, nor bite the lip as angry wretches will, nor hast thou pleasure to be cross and talk, but thou with mildness entertainst thy wooers with gentle comforts, soft as an affable. Go, fool, and whom thou keeps command. Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed. And therefore, setting all this chat aside, <laughs> thus in plain terms, your father hath consented that you shall be my wife. Your dowry agreed on. And will you, will you, I will marry you. Now, Kate, I am a husband for your turn, for by this light, whereby I see thy beauty, thy beauty that doth make me like thee well. Thou shalt be married to no other man but me. For I am him born to tame you, Kate, and turning from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable as other household Kates. Oh, my dear good father, never make denial. I must and will have Catherine to my wife. And Petruchio marries Catherine. And he brings her to his house where he begins his taming. Where be these knaves? What? No man at door to hold my stirrups nor to take my horse? Where's Curio? Here, here, sir. Here, sir. Head is in unpolished room. What? No attendance, no regard, no duty? You peasant swain, you horseman, malt horse drudge. Did I not bid thee meet me in the park? Go, rascal, go! Fetch my supper in. 
Where's the one that they found it? Where are those? Welcome. Sound, 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 sound! Off oh, with my boots, you rogue. You villain, when? Out, you rogue, you pluck my foot awry. Take that and mend the plucking off the other. Be merry, Kate. Some water here, what ho? Where's my spring of choice? So you're a get you, Henson, bid my cousin Ferdinand come hither. One case that you must kiss and be acquainted with. Where are my slippers? Shall I have some water? Come, Kate, wash. And welcome to our room. You whoresome villain. Will you let it fall? A horse and beetle headed flap your knave. Come, Kate, sit down. I know you have a stomach. Will you give thanks, sweet Kate, or else shall I? What's this? Mutton? Aye. Starts and so is all the meat! What talks are these? Where is the rascal cook? How durst you, villain? Bring it from the dresser and serve it thus to me that love it not. There! Take it to you, trenchers, cups, and all, you heedless jolt head and the mannered slave! Uh, Do you grumble? I'll be with you straight! I pray you, husband! Gender's collar, plant of danger, and better twere that both the bus did fast, since of ourselves, ourselves are taller, and feed it with such over roasted flesh. Be patient. Tomorrow it shall be mended, and for tonight we'll fast for company. Come, I will bring thee to thy bridal chamber. Thus have I politically begun my reign, and tis my hope to end successfully. She eat no meat today, nor none shall eat. Last night she slept not, nor tonight she shall not. As with the meat, some undeserved fault I'll find about the making of the bed. Here I'll fling the pillow. There the bolster, this way the coverlet, another way the sheets. I, and amid this hurly, I intend that all is done in reverent care of her. And if she chance to nod, I'll rail and brawl, and with the clamor keep her still awake. This is a way to kill a wife with kindness, and thus I'll curb her mad and headstrong humor. He that knows better how to tame a shrew, now let him speak! <laughs> Kate is taken by Petruchio once more to her hometown. It is here where everyone has reunited for Bianca and Lucentio's wedding reception that Kate must face her fate by forcing the other, ma by forcing the other wives to reprimand their husbands for not s submitting to them. Come, come, you froward and unable worms. My mind has been as big as one of yours. My heart is great, my reason happily more, to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws. Our strength is weak, our weakness past compare. That seeming to be most which we indeed least are. Then pale your stumps, for it is no boot, and place your hand 
below your husband's foot. In token of which duty, if he please, my hand is ready, may it do him ease. Why, there's a wench. Come on. by breaking Kate into submission. But what if the power configuration were more evenly distributed to yield a husband and wife who are equal partners who join forces against the cruel view of gender roles? <coughs> Good morrow, Kate, for that's your name, I hear. Well, have you heard, but something hard of hearing. They call me Catherine, that do talk of me. You lie and say, for you are called plain Kate. And funny Kate. And sometimes Kate the curse. But Kate, the prettiest Kate in Christendom. Kate of Kate Hall, my super dainty Kate, for dainties are all Kates. <laughs> Therefore, take this of me, Kate of my consolation. Hearing thy mildness praise in every town, thy virtue spoke of, and thy beauty sounded, yet not so deeply as to thee belongs, myself removed to woo thee for my wife. Moved? <laughs> in good time. Let him that moved you hither remove you hence. I knew you at the first. You were immovable. Why? What's immovable? A joint stool. Thou hast hit it. Come, sit on me. <laughs> Asses are made to bear, and so are you. Women are made to bear, and so are you. No such jade as you, if me you mean. Alas, good Kate, I will not burden thee, for knowing thee to be but young and light. Too light for such a swain as you to catch, and yet as heavy as my weight should be. Come, come, you wasp, in faith, you are too angry. If I be waspish, best beware my sting. My remedy is then to pluck it out. I, if the fool could find it where it lies. Who knows not where a wasp does wear his sting? In his tail? In his tongue. Whose tongue? Yours, if you talk of tails, and so farewell. What, with my tongue in your tail? <laughs> Nay, come, Kate, come. You must not look so sour. It is my fashion when I see a crab. Why, here's no crab, and therefore look not sour. <laughs> there is, there is. Then show it me. Had I a glass, I would. What? You mean my face. Well aimed of such a young one. Now by St. George I am too young for you. Yet you are withered. Tis with cares. I care not. Twas told me you were rough, and coy, and subtle. And now I find report a very liar. For thou art pleasant, gamesome, passing courteous, but slow in speech. Yet sweet as springtime flowers. Thou canst not frown, thou canst not look askance, nor bite the lip as angry wenches will, nor hath thou pleasure to be cross in talk. But thou with mildness entertainst thy wooers with gentle conference, soft and affable. Where did you study all this goodly speech? It is extempore from my mother wit. A witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Enough to keep you warm. Mary, so I mean, sweet Catherine, in thy bed. Therefore, setting all this chat aside, thus in plain terms, your father hath consented that you shall be my wife. Your dowry greed on, and will you nil you, I will marry you. Now, Kate, I am a husband for your turn. For by this light, whereby I see thy beauty, Thy beauty that doth make me like thee well. <laughs> Thou must be married to no man but me, for I am he and born to tame you, Kate, and bring you from a wild Kate to a Kate conformable, as are other household Kates. Here comes your father. Never make denial. I must and will have Catherine to my wife. Petruchio, how speak you with my daughter? How but well, sir, how but well. 
'Twere impossible I should speed amiss, and to conclude, we have greed so well that on Sunday is the wedding day. I'll see thee hanged on Sunday first. Hark, Petruchio. She says she'll see thee hanged on Sunday first. Be patient, gentlemen. What's it to you if she and I be pleased? Tis bargain twixt us twain that she shall still be cursed in company. Give me thy hand, Kate. I will unto Venice to buy apparel against the wedding day. Provide the feast, father, and bid the guests. I will be sure my Catherine shall be fine. Now I know not what to say, but give me your hands. God save you, Petruchio. To the match. <laughs> <laughs> And as their friends and family are heading off to celebrate, Petruchio interrupts the festivities. <laughs> Gentlemen and friends, I thank you for your pains. I know you think to dine with me today and have set aside great store of wedding cheer. But so it is, my haste doth call me hence, and therefore here I mean to take my leave. <laughs> it is possible you will away tonight. I must away today, before <laughs> night come. Make it no wonder if you knew my business, you would entreat me rather go than stay. And honest company, I thank you all that have beheld me give away myself to this most patient, sweet, and virtuous wife. Dine with my father, drink a health to me for I must hence, and farewell to you all. Let us entreat you stay till after dinner. It may not be. Let me entreat you stay. It cannot be. Let me entreat you. I am content. Are you content to stay? I am content that you shall entreat me stay, but yet not stay, entreat me how you can. <laughs> now, if you love me, stay. Grumio? My horse. Aye, sir, they be ready. Nay, then, do what thou canst. I will not go today, no, nor tomorrow, not till I please myself. The door is open, sir, there lies your way. You may be jogging whilst your boots are green. For me, I'll not be gone till I please myself. O oh, Kate, content thee. Prithee be not angry. I will be angry, what hast thou to do? Father, be quiet, he shall stay my leisure. Mary, sir. Now it begins to work. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, forward to the bridal dinner. I see a woman may be made a fool if she had not a spirit to resist. They shall go forward at thy command, Kate. Obey the bride, you that attend on her. Go to the feast, revel and domineer. Carouse full measure to her maiden head. Be mad and merry, or go hang yourselves. But for my bonny Kate, she must with me. Nay, look not big, nor stamp, nor stare, nor fret. I will be master of what is mine own. She is my goods, my chattels. She is my house, my household stuff. She is my field, my barn. She is my horse, my ox, my ass, my anything. And there she stands. Touch her, whoever dare. I'll bring mine action on the proudest he that stops my way in Padua. Grumio, draw forth thy weapon. We are beset with thieves. Rescue thy mistress if thou be a man. <laughs> Fear not, sweet wench. They shall not touch thee, Kate. I'll buckler thee against a million. <laughs> Kate does follow Petruchio to his home in Verona, and on the return home, Petruchio does some more taming along the way. Come on, in God's name, once more toward our fathers. Look. How bright and goodly shines the moon. The moon? 
I say it is the moon that shines so bright. I know it is the sun that shines so bright. Oh, now by my mother's son, and that is myself, it shall be moon, or star, or what I list, or ere I go to your father's. Go then, fetch the horses back again. Ever more crossed and crossed. Nothing but cross. Say as he says, or we shall never go. Forward, I pray, since we have come so far. And be it moon, or sun, or what you please, and if you please to call it a rush candle, henceforth I vow it shall be so for me. I say it is the moon. I know it is the moon. Nay, then, you lie. It is the blessed sun. Then God be blessed, it is the blessed sun. But the sun is not when you say it is not, and the moon changes even as your mind. What you will have it named, even that it is, and so it shall be so for Catherine. Petruchio, go thy ways. The field is won. First, kiss me, Kate, and then we will. What? <laughs> In the midst of the street? What, art thou ashamed of me? No, sir, God forbid, but ashamed to kiss. Why, then, let's home again. <clears throat> Nay, I will give thee a kiss. <laughs> now pray thee, love, stay. Is this not well? Come, my sweet Kate, better once than never, for never too late. Soon after, a gathering Lucentio's house. At last, the longer jarring notes agree, and time it is when raging war is done. To smile that escapes and perils overblown. My fair Bianca, bid my father welcome while I with self same kindness welcome thine. Brother Petruchio, sister Catherine, and thou Hortensio with thy loving widow. Peace with the best, and welcome to my house. Who affords nothing but what is kind. For both our sakes, I would that word were true. Now, for my life, Hortensio fears his widow. <laughs> then never trust me if I be afeard. You are very <coughs> sensible, and yet you miss my sense. <laughs> I mean, Hortensio is afeard of you. Hmm. He that is giddy thinks the world turns round. Roundly reply. Mistress, how mean you that? Thus I conceive by him. Conceives by me. How like Hortensio then? My widow says, thus she conceives her tale. <laughs> <laughs> Very well met. Kiss him for that, good widow. <laughs> he that is giddy thinks the world turns round. I pray you, tell me what you meant by that. Your husband, being troubled with a shrew, measures my husband's sorrow by his woe. And now you know my meaning. A very mean meaning. Right. I mean you. And I am mean indeed, respecting you. <laughs> to her, Kate. To her, widow. A hundred marks my Kate does put her down. Well, now, in good sadness, son Petruchio, I think thou hast the very shrew of all. Well, I say no. <clears throat> and therefore, to make assurance, let's each one send unto his wife. And he whose wife is most obedient, to come at first when he doth send for her, shall win the wager which we will propose. Content. What is the wager? Twenty crowns. Twenty crowns? I'll venture so much of my hawk or hound, but twenty times so much upon my wife. A hundred, then. Content. A match. Tis done. Who shall begin? That will I. Don't be in Dillo and bid your mistress come to you. I guess. Son, I'll be your half, Bianca comes. Or perhaps I'll bear it all myself. Sir, my mistress sends you word that she is busy and she cannot come. What? <laughs> How? 
She is busy and cannot come. Is that an answer? And a kind one, too. Pray God, sir, your wife send not a worse. I hope better. <laughs> Go, be and entreat my wife come to me forthwith. Oh, ho, entreat her. Nay, then she must needs come. I am afraid, sir, do what you can. Yours will not be entreated. Now, where is my wife? She says you have some goodly jest in hand. She will not come. She bids you come to her. <laughs> oh, worse and worse. Vile, intolerable, not to be endured. Sirrah Grumio, go to your mistress. Say to her, I command her come to me. I know her answer. <clears throat> what? She will not. The foul or fortune mine, and there an end. Now by my holy day, and here comes Catherine. Oh. <gasps> what is your will, sir, that you send for me? Where is your sister and Hortensio's wife? They sit conferring by the parlor fire. Bring them hither, I say. And if they deny to come, swinge me them soundly forth unto their husbands. Away, I say, and bring them hither straight. Why, well, here is a wonder if you ever check the wonder. <laughs> and, uh, so it is. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what it bodes. <laughs> Mary, peace it bodes, and love, and quiet life, and awful rule, and right supremacy. To be short, what's not that's uh, sweet and happy? Now, fair befall thee, good Petruchio, the wager thou hast won, and I will add unto their losses twenty thousand crowns. Another dowry to another daughter, for she is changed, as had never been. Nay, I will win my wager better yet, with more sign of her obedience, her new-built virtue and obedience. <laughs> Catherine, that cap of yours becomes you not. Off with that bauble, throw it underfoot. Oh, Lord! I mean never have a cause to sigh to be brought to such a silly pass as this. Spy, what a foolish duty call you this? This be your duty. The wisdom of your duty, my fair Bianca, hath cost me a hundred crowns in supper time. The more fool you for laying on my duty. <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, I charge thee, tell these headstrong women what duty they do owe their lords and husbands. <laughs> come, come, you're mocking. We will have no telling. I say there will be a telling, and first begin with her. She shall not. I say she shall, and first begin with her. Why fie, are knit that threatening, unkind brow, and dart not scornful glances from those eyes to wound thy lord, thy king, thy governor? It blots thy beauty as frost do bite the knees, Confounds thy fame as whirlwind Shakespeare bud, and in no <coughs> sense is neat or amiable. A woman moved is like a fountain troubled, muddy, ill seeming, thick, bereft of beauty. And while it is so, none so dry or thirsty will deign to sip or touch one drop of it. <laughs> <laughs> thy husband is thy lord. Thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign, one who cares for thee and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labor, both by sea and land, to watch the night in storms, the day in cold. Whilst thou, thy warm at home, secure and safe, and crave no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience, too little payment for so great a debt. Oh. Oh. <laughs> such a duty as the subject owes the prince, even such a woman oweth to her husband. And when she is froward, peevish, sullen, sour, and not obedient to his honest will, what is she but a foul contending rebel and graceless traitor to her loving lord? Come, come, you froward and un 
able worms. My mind has been as big as one of yours, my heart as great, my reason happily more, to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now I see our lances are but straws, our strength as weak, our weakness past compare. That seeming to be most which we indeed least are, then veil your stomachs, for it is no boot, and place your hands below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please, my hand is ready. May it do him ease. <laughs> There's a wish. <laughs> now come on. <laughs> and kiss me, Kate. <laughs> well, go thy ways, old lad, for thou shalt have. <laughs> come, Kate, we'll to bed. We three are merry, but you two are sped. <laughs> <laughs> Kate and Petruchio were equals. But what if she was defined? Even though she complies verbally with Petruchio, what if she is the one who is actually in control of the relationship? Come on in God's name! Once more toward our fathers! Look, how bright and goodly shines the moon. The moon? The sun? It is not moonlight now. I say, it is the moon that shines so bright. I know, it is the sun that shines so bright. Now, by my mother's sun, it shall be moon, or star, or what I list, or ere I go to your father's. <laughs> go then, fetch the horses back again. Evermore crossed and crossed, nothing. But crossed, say as he says, or we shall never go. <laughs> Forward, I pray, since we have come so far, and be it moon, or sun, or what you please, and if you please to call it a rush candle, henceforth, I vow it shall be so for me. I say it is the moon. I know it is the moon. Nay, then, you lie, it is the blessed sun. Then God be blessed. It is the blessed sun. But sun it is not when you say it is not. And the moon changes even as your mind. What you will have it named, even that it is. And so it shall be so, but Catherine. Uh, Petruchio, go thy ways. The field is won. I charge thee, tell these headstrong women what duty they do owe their lords and husbands. Come, come, you're mocking. We'll have no telling. I say there will be a telling, and first begin with her. She shall not. I say she shall, and first begin with her. shake their buds, and in no sense is meet or amiable. A woman moved is like a fountain troubled, muddy, ill-seen, thick, bereft of beauty. And while it is so, none so dry or thirsty would deign to sip or touch one drop of it. <laughs> thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign. One who cares for thee, and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labor both by sea and land, to watch the night and storm, the day and cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and crave no other tribute at thy hand but love. Fair look, 
and true obedience to little payment for so great a debt. Such duty as the subject owes the prince, even such a woman oweth to her husband. And when she is froward, peevish, sullen, sour, and not obedient to his honest will, what is she but a foul contending rebel, a graceless traitor to her loving lord? I am ashamed that women are so simple to offer war when they should kneel for peace or seek for rule, supremacy, and sway when they are bound to serve, love, and obey. Why are our bodies oh. separate and weak and smooth? I know it's all over the world, but that our soft conditions and our hearts should well and free with our external hearts. Oh, my mind has been the biggest one of yours. Then veil your stomach, for it is no boot, and place your hand below your husband's foot. <laughs> and so so with duty, if he please, my hand is ready, man, do him ease. Why, there's a wench. Now, come on and kiss me, Kate. Oh. <laughs> changing the gender of the actors playing Kate and Petruchio. The Renaissance Theater employed males for both men's and women's roles. We chose to examine what it might mean to flip the convention by having a woman play Petruchio. Nay, hear you, Kate, and suit you state not so. 
Go, fool, and who now keeps command? Oh, <laughs> did ever Diane so become a girl of escape this chamber with her princely gate? Oh, be thou Diane, and let her be king. Where did you learn such goodly speech? It is extempore from my mother wit. <laughs> a witty mother, witless else her son. Am I not wise? Enough to keep you warm. Mary, so I need sweet Catherine in thy bed. Oh! <laughs> Back to the conventions of Shakespeare's stage, Kate would have been played by a young man whose voice had not yet dropped. What might it mean to see a male actor play the archetype of the tamed Kate? Hi. Hi. Amid that threatening, unkind brow, and dark, not scornful glances from those eyes to wound. Thy lord, <laughs> thy king, thy governor, blots thy beauty as frosts do bite the meads, confounds thy fame as whirlwinds shake fair buds, and in no sense is meet or amiable. A woman moved like a fountain troubled, muddy, ill-seeming, thick, Reft of beauty, and while it is so, none so dry or thirsty will deign to sip or touch one drop of it. I am ashamed that women are so simple to offer war where they should kneel for peace or seek for rule, supremacy, and sway when they are bound to serve, love, and obey. Why are our bodies? Soft and weak and smooth, <clears throat> unapt to toil and trouble in the world, but that our soft conditions and our hearts should well agree with our external parts. Come, come, you froward and unable worms. My mind hath been as big as one of yours, my heart as great, my reason haply more, to bandy word for word and frown for frown. But now, I see, our lances are but straws, our strength as weak, our weakness past compare, that seeming to be most which we indeed least are, <coughs> then veil your stomachs, for it is no boot, and place your hand below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he please, my hand is ready, may it do him. The full text of Shakespeare's The Taming of the Shrew is actually a play within a play. The induction scene, or the outer play, shows the lord of the estate setting out to play a joke on the village drunk, Christopher Sly. Now, most productions cut the induction scene, a few keep it, and some go so far as to cast Sly in the role of Petruchio. But what of Kate? What if Kate is a man, forced by the lord to play the role of Kate, and endure a woman's lot in life at the hands of the cruel and drunken sly. Fie, fie, unknit that threatening unkind brow and dart not scornful glances from those eyes to wound my lord, thy king, thy governor. It blots thy beauty as frost do bite the meads, confounds thy fame as whirlwinds shake fair buds, and in no sense is meet or amiable. Thy husband is thy lord, thy life, thy keeper, thy head, thy sovereign, one who cares for thee and for thy maintenance commits his body to painful labor both by sea and land, to watch the night and storms, the day and cold, whilst thou liest warm at home, secure and safe, and craves no other tribute at thy hands but love, fair looks, and true obedience. 
too little payment for so great a debt. I am ashamed that women are so simple to offer war where they should kneel for peace or seek for rule, supremacy, and sway when they are bound to serve, love, and obey. Come, come, you forward and unable worms! My mind hath been as big as one of yours. My heart is great, my reason happily more. To bandy word for word and frown for frown? Now I see our lances are but straws. Our strength is weak, our weakness past compare. That seeming to be most, which we indeed least are. Unveil your stomach. For it is no boot, and place your hands below your husband's foot, in token of which duty, if he plead, my hand is ready, may it do him ease. part of our project, but before we begin our discussion, we would like to remind you of the six approaches which we have explored here tonight. First, Elizabethan. <laughs> and Romance. And partners. And defiant. <laughs> and gender. Before we begin our discussion, we'd like to remind you of the validity and the problems that each of these approaches hold. I think we as a class, this has been a semester-long class actually that this project has stemmed out of, we've realized that there is no specific way to produce Shakespeare from this. So now we'd really like to open the floor for questions and feedback from you guys regarding the approaches that you've seen tonight or regarding anything regarding the class or what you saw, anything that might have been interesting to you. So feel free to ask any questions and give any feedback <coughs> that you'd like. Any comments, anything? Yes. I would love to know how the uh, high school students that you performed, if I understand correctly, yeah. you brought this into the high schools. Share some of the experiences that you might have had in our local <laughs> high schools. I'd love to. Um, <laughs> go ahead. Okay, I'll take this one. Uh, we, yes, we went to three different high schools in the area, uh, and the experiences with them were, were pretty similar uh, at the beginning. They kind of came into the space being like, oh great, well it's an excuse to miss class, and you know, that's cool. Uh, because we actually went to them rather than them coming to us. So they were kind of skeptical at first, of course, as high schoolers are when they're seeing Shakespeare. Uh, but then, as soon as we got the ball rolling, they got very engaged, very quickly. And by the end, everyone was kind of like, oh, this is awesome. And they had so many questions to ask us and were so receptive to what we were presenting that it was really inspirational to see that it is different. When you're reading it in a book, which a lot of times in high school, that's all we're exposed to with Shakespeare, it's so much different than when you're seeing it live in front of you. And it was great to see them inspired by that. It, it, it doesn't mean nearly as much when you're reading it because he did write it for it to be performed. So you cannot compare to how it would be when it's performed, you know, if you can't compare that to, to the written, to the text itself. So. Yes. 
Um, this is kind of a collective question, so whoever can answer. How did each different approach change how you looked at the characters in the text? I think that goes to each person kind of took their own interpretation on it. I mean, we were given the interpretations by the directors, but um, I think everybody has a different answer for that. I think you can't. I mean, whoever wants to. Uh, well, I'll just start, and like when, uh, for the approaches where we played the same characters, like for two of them, I was the widow, and we worked with Tom Cornford. That was his uh, name. That's yeah, correct. And um, he's from England, and he came and worked with us, and he was amazing. But he talked about atmosphere a lot, and um, how we wanted each world of each approach to be completely different from the next. And so, when you're a character in one scene, and this uh, the same character in another, or an approach, and then the next approach. Um, that kind of helped me change. Like, so like, for instance, in the partners, our atmosphere is like judgmental. So that would be different from when we're doing defiance, a different sort of atmosphere. So that's how I took it, not as Kate. I think also it relates back to, we did a lot of talking about this throughout the semester. Um, so obviously this has been our focus was this one script. Uh, I think a lot of it relates back to our discussion that we've had about how we initially read the text. We all read it in a different light, a lot of them stemming out of the approaches, the six approaches that we showed tonight. Uh, some of us read it as a commentary on gender, some of us read it as a commentary on abusive relationships, some of us read it as a romance, like, it's very, very different to see how we all approach the situation and approach this play, and how none of us were more justified than the other. We all had our own justification, yeah, it was equally balanced. And I'd say the hardest part is, you first look at the text, you're like, okay, he is absolutely evil, how do I change that? How do I turn him into romantic? Um, so that, that's, that's one thing that you have to look at when you first look at that text and you're trying to, to make different approaches out of it, which, is very, which can be difficult. But um, yeah, you just work around that. And really Tom Cornford, who um, Casey, Casey mentioned him, um, he helped a lot with the atmospheres. And it's like you're walking into a different atmosphere when you go from from partnership to romance to, to defiant to um, cruel, you know, it, it, the atmosphere was really helped and it changed a lot. It actually all stemmed from the monologue that you guys heard a plethora of times. That, um, that is kind of where we started the journey and coming to where we are now. And um, our look at that is really where a lot of this is stemmed from. In fact, the first set of lines that everybody here learned was that monologue. Everybody here knows that monologue. Well, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Go ahead. Uh, did this class and this project change your view of Shakespeare, and if so, how? Mm, yeah. I, well, one of the main things that we talked about is that um, Shakespeare's not timeless like we think he is. Um, and I always thought he was, and then wonderful Andrew back there and Kelly, who are our directors, which did a great job. So. <laughs> I mean, if you just look at the words verbatim in this show, it is not okay to do this. I mean, especially in this day, day and age. So that's what I took away from this. Bouncing off of that, yeah, I think for me, it was very much realizing that everything is conformed, whether it's Shakespeare or not, all works need to be conformed to the audience that they're presented to. Uh, and I think that's very important that we sometimes leave out that whole aspect of it. We're just so focused on putting plays on the stage. We just have to get it on the stage and people will come versus realizing who we're doing the play for. What is the commentary we're trying to get them to walk away with? Uh, very much all of these approaches left you with different feelings in the audience. We felt the atmosphere with you guys shift as we shift approaches. And I think that's very, very important to realize that all works, especially Shakespeare, which like we said, needs to be justified for different reasons with the text. It's very important to realize that you need to keep in mind what your audience is. You're doing work. I think it's interesting that you say that, that um, we um, have to present it in a way that would, in certain different ways, I think the audience or the audience society itself changes theater rather than theater changes society because we've had to perform it in all these ways to justify it because society has changed itself. It's not so much, I think, that we're changing society, but society kind of determines what we do up here. Right? It's all in the audience perception. At any point during the production or the, the practice or the study of script, did any of you look at another production of something similar for either 
guidance, inspiration, or is it encouraged to avoid that so you don't have any preconceived parachutes? You, you normally, yeah, you normally um, well, avoid that. One thing actually for the partnership approach that we really, really looked at um, was Shakespeare's Much Ado About Nothing because the relationship between the two main characters is very much like the Kate Petruchio relationship where it's back and forth and back and forth and they're like very headstrong, very smart people who there's always something underneath like what they're always talking about um, and that's really what we wanted to focus on with our relationship. So we watched um, clips from the Joss Whedon's version of Much Do About Nothing um, to get kind of inspiration of what we wanted to help portray for our scenes. Um, and that text was really the most influential, I guess, for our approach. I think going off of that, we also, when we got into gender, uh, both Kelly and Andrew were wonderful in sharing their experiences, seeing two very different productions. Uh, the one where we had all the women on stage, Andrew was telling us about a production that he saw uh, where it was an all-woman cast, much like back in Elizabethan times, it would have been an all-male cast. Uh, and so we kind of looked at flipping the convention on its head in that sense, and that's kind of where that part stemmed from. And also with the Christopher Sly um, being thrust into the world as a woman, Kelly uh, actually brought into, into light this, this approach that she saw uh, where it was very much, he was still a man, but he was just forced to live as a woman. So yes, we did look at other approaches kind of to, to look into our project. So uh, talking about the approaches, um, are there uh, like those same kind of approaches but on other Shakespeare plays like uh, Othello and Hamlet and stuff? Or you can interpret however you, you can because yes. however you want. The Taming of the Shrew doesn't necessarily already have those approaches. It doesn't have those approaches already. We, we create those approaches. So and you can do the same with Othello. You can do it with whatever Shakespeare play you want. Although Taming of the Shrew does allow for a lot more room yeah. to bring. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the conflict. There's um, what we call subtext, and it's how you say what you want to say without saying what you want to say. <laughs> no one actually ever says what they want to say. It's using words, <laughs> using yeah. the script, and using the lines you have as tools to get what you want. Yeah, and so um, with any play, it's the lines are for your disposal, and you figure out how to use them to get what your character would want from them. Back there. To follow up the comment of the gentleman over here on the right about studying other productions, mm -hmm. I myself have never been a big fan of Elizabeth Taylor, but there is one <laughs> performance that she did in Taming of the Shrew with Richard Burton, and it's about a 55-year-old movie done in the early 60s, I believe. You might want to spend a buck and uh, watch her performance of Catherine, particularly at the end. Uh, she did a, I, found, I thought, a most impressive job. Of course, I was in high school, what I did. <laughs> but I was a big fan of uh, Shakespeare. Thank you very much. Anyone else have any other questions or comments? Oh, back there. Thank you. I have a question. So the uh, gender politics that were kind of like understood and conveyed within this play, was it understood through a lens of gender politics during um, Shakespearean times or during um, modern times? That one depended on the approach somewhat. Um, for Elizabethan, we wanted to kind of go from their lens a little bit because back then it was very much like they had um, archetypes and it's like the servants and then you had like the lovers who walk around like this and um, that kind of deal. So that one, even though it wasn't so much about the gender politics, it was still within the Elizabethan view. And then um, for something like partners, that one would have been more like what um, we view relationships as today. I think also going off of that, when we did gender ourselves, it was also a little bit of both. Uh, <laughs> Sammy and I did a lot of exploring the stereotypes of what the opposite gender is, and very much emphasizing the stereotypes. Because if you think about it, in Elizabethan times, what that boy was portraying on stage was the stereotype of what a woman should be. 
And so, in the same way, I think we looked a lot into today, we, ex we combined the two and looked at today, what is, what is a man's man? And what is, what is a woman's woman? And explored that a little bit with when we were playing around. Yeah. Do you think um, that also gives you like a better um, and a better understanding of how gender roles are today, and maybe some of the conflicts that still exist even in modern times? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, I'm a little bit more confused about it because it made me think about things that I never really thought about um, not being okay. Like even in wedding ceremonies, it's like the father is giving away the daughter and it's giving up your name as if it's property and even if that's not what it means it still kind of makes me question that whole yeah. part of the wedding it's funny to think about how much we haven't changed and we think we have we have room to grow yeah thank you of course thank you anything else well we'd like to thank